This is Keys to the Shop, episode 116, Understanding Gentrification with Dr. Stacy Sutton. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show, and um, I'm really happy to have you here on the show today because we're talking about a topic that it can get a little hairy, honestly. It's a really, um, uh, it's not a pleasant topic to talk about because the reality of gentrification is antithetical to the mission of retail coffee, of, of coffee shops to be a place for the community. And instead, we see a large number of communities being displaced. And uh, we want to understand what's going on with gentrification. And we have a very special guest today, Dr. Stacy Sutton of the University of Illinois, Chicago, is joining us to uh, talk about this. And let me tell you, we'll absolutely walk away from this conversation with Dr. Sutton today, not only with a better understanding of this topic, um, but also with some actions that we can take as coffee professionals to help be a part of the solution. So today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Now, Prima Coffee is a specialty coffee equipment supplier. They're based out of Louisville, Kentucky, and from the very beginning, they've set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public and professionals alike. They really focus on curating the best equipment for every need, not only home equipment, but also commercial equipment uh, from grinders to espresso machines, undercounter refrigeration, um, brewers, you name it. If you have a need in your cafe to upgrade your equipment or if you're opening a new cafe and you need to be outfitted with the right gear for your space, definitely look up Prima Coffee. They put a big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. Uh, just visit them at prima-coffee.com. That's prima-coffee.com. And when you check out, be sure to let them know that Keys to the Shop sent you. And uh, my thanks to Prima for their support of Keys to the Shop. Today's episode is also brought to you by Pacific Foods. Now, they're the folks behind the Pacific Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages. Uh, those are designed specifically for the professional barista and the standards for excellence that they demand. So whether you're talking about almond, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, their newest product, it has the ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on coffee. And that makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. Pacific is a huge supporter of the specialty coffee community. They've demonstrated this in coming up with these great beverages uh, born from listening to the needs of real specialty coffee professionals. So go to pacificfoods.com. That's pacificfoods.com and see how the barista series line of non-dairy performance beverages can really help elevate the non-dairy offerings in your cafe. So thank you very much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. All right, so today we are talking about gentrification. So a uh, serious topic for today's uh, Keys to the Shop and one that really does need to be discussed because coffee shops have begun to be seen and, and have for a while been seen as harbingers of gentrification. And that ultimately means the displacement and disinvestment in a community, um, which is ironic because in coffee shops, we, are, we, we consider ourselves um, the third place. Um, sociologically speaking, that means we are not home or work. We're a place where the community gathers, and ultimately this contributes to the fabric of that community. But gentrification is antithetical to community. You know, if you have a core set of values written out in your, your shop or your business, one of the things that you might have on there, it's very likely, is a love for people, serving people, and serving your community. Uh, that cannot happen, really, if we are uh, unwittingly contributing to or willingly contributing to gentrification. However, it's not as simple as just, you know, coffee shops doing this. There's a lot of moving pieces that involves politics and policy, land use, and things like that. Things that we don't know enough about. I know I don't know enough about this. And that's why we are talking with our guest today 
uh, Dr. Stacy Sutton. Um, Dr. Sutton is the Assistant Professor of Urban Planning and Policy in the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her research focuses on uh, worker cooperatives, economic democracy, equitable development, and racially disparate effects of place-based policy and planning. She is on the organizing committee for the Chicagoland Cooperative Ecosystem Coalition. She is an ad hoc committee member at the Urban Affairs Association Conference. Dr. Sutton holds a joint PhD in urban planning and sociology from Rutgers University and an MBA from New York University. Dr. Sutton is a highly published researcher. Uh, her work appears in the Urban Affairs Review, Journal of Planning, Education Research, and uh, the Economic Development Quarterly, uh, to name a few. And we'll have a link to uh, further explore those as well. Dr. Sutton is widely considered one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject of gentrification and urban planning. And today, she is going to help us understand what is behind gentrification what we misunderstand about it, how our misunderstandings contribute to it, and what we can do in retail to be part of the solution and not part of the problem in gentrification. The thing that I got the most out of this conversation and what I hope you leave this conversation with is not only a better understanding of the subject and not only some um, solutions that you can put in place, Uh, both in our thinking and our actions, but a desire to continue to learn more about this. Um, I've provided a lot of links in the show notes, but this is not to be taken as a one-and-done episode. This is something that is a challenging subject and one that does require further research, research that I think uh, is worth doing. So with that said, let's kick off um, this process of understanding gentrification with our special guest, Dr. Stacy Sutton. Dr. Sutton, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm so honored to have you on the program. Thanks, Chris. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I uh, discovered your TED Talk, um, I think it was 2015, uh, TEDx New York, on um, what we don't understand about gentrification, and it was an amazing talk, first of all, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And uh, I wanted to really explore this topic more with you um, on the show because we have so much um, in the coffee industry uh, to talk about in terms of gentrification. We're kind of the uh, coffee shops are kind of a figurehead <laughs> for this, yeah. if you yeah. will. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I so I, I am pleased to be here, and I'm really uh, fortunate that you reached out. I think it's um, it's a it's a testament to the dilemma that we're all working with. Um, and you're right. I think it's, they, they symbolize coffee and uh, coffee shops symbolize something, but, um, they may be taking a lot more of the burden than, than necessary, but nevertheless, it's a symbolic, uh, gesture, um, in terms of what it means to have a new kind of coffee shop in a neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I, I was curious to know what yeah, your career is, uh, based around urban planning and, uh, your academic career. I wonder if you could just give us a synopsis of, um, your, your academic work and how it led you to not only focus on urban planning, but kind of become a, a spokesperson for, um, gentrification and understanding uh, what's behind it. Sure. Although I would like to say that I don't know if I'm a spokesperson. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of scholars. I'm I'm just kind of following in a long kind of legacy of scholars that have been uh, writing about, thinking about, speaking about gentrification for decades, right? And so I don't know uh, if if you know the term is has been around since the '60s, right? It was first coined mm-hmm. in '64. So you know, this is something that I'm just kind of building on. In terms of my background, um, I came to academia through this somewhat circuitous route in that I did an MBA, worked in corporate for a while, really did not like that, um, struck working in kind of management consulting in that form. And but I realized the reason I went back to school to do an MBA was I was interested in community economic development. What analytical skills could I learn and bring to community um, to kind of help in to to you know work on the revitalization of inner city communities, uh, you know, work with inner city communities in that way. 
Um, and realizing that I knew very little about policy or about, you know, the various decisions and decision makers that helped these communities get this way, right? Not necessarily the people in the community, but those extra local to the community, you know, the policy makers. I needed to learn a bit about that. So I did a policy degree. And through that, my mentor said, you really need to go into planning because planning, urban planning is about theorizing social action, right? It's, it's, it's a newer discipline relative to other social sciences, but it really allows you to take the social theories that we think about, especially in sociology, economics, political science, um, and apply kind of ap- application, you know, so it's really what we call like praxis in that way. So I entered the urban planning program um, and <laughs> decided that, okay, so this is great. However, I should probably be more also grounded in the disciplines. And so I did a joint PhD, quite honestly, in urban planning and sociology. And that was perfect for me. Um, and in that, I focused on community economic development, which is the kind of combination of community development, folks that think about housing and neighborhood and processes of change, and economic development, those who think about the business development, um, investment, uh, you know, revenue for the city and so forth. And so by bringing those together, which is itself a discipline, you're really thinking about, you know, the localism, economic localism. Um, at least that's how I framed it. Um, so my research, I focused on a neighborhood in Brooklyn, right? And it's in that way, perhaps that's why I've become a spokesperson, because Brooklyn is perhaps one of the uh, <laughs> signifiers of the 21st century gentrification. Right? Sure. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, so I know that whole trajectory of, of uh, you know, the mid 20th century uh, through early 21st century, seeing that change, experiencing that change. Um, and so I kind of focused on the neighborhood, not just the neighborhood I grew up in, but, um, uh, you know, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, and, and a little bit of Bedford Cyber Center, right? And I understood that neighborhood, or I came to understand that neighborhood through the lens of black business owners. Most people studying gentrification and neighborhood change were focusing on residents, and I thought it was really interesting that there was this strong cluster of business owners who entered the neighborhood at different times, but there, because there was still such a legacy there, um, I could speak with folks who entered the neighborhood when the neighborhood was disparaged, when the neighborhood was labeled ghetto, when when it was difficult to get loans to enter this neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. So I was curious as to why they chose those neighborhoods. And everyone told me, oh, it's relegation. These folks just don't have either the human capital or financial capital to, to go elsewhere. And that was couldn't be further from the truth in terms of the um, the array of business owners that were there. There were some that for whom the, you know, this, this being an entrepreneur was their primary or the only option perhaps, but many and most of them, um, made a choice. They had agency. They said, Hey, we want to, we're either from this neighborhood or from a, a similar neighborhood and we want to establish a business here. Uh, a lot of them were highly capitalized. There were people that, well, that's where Spike Lee's shop was. That's where, you know, Alice, Do- Alice Walker, the author, her daughter started a coffee shop uh, with her partner there. And it was through that and some of the restaurants that were opening. And this was in the early 90s when the neighborhood, were, again, was still considered, quote unquote, get up. Um, so that that's really what I was, I've always been kind of interested in. What What is the motivation? Why did people come to this neighborhood and start businesses? And why do they stay? And then the, 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 the end of that story is, well, why do they have to leave if they have to leave? Why do they choose to leave or why do they get pushed out? So in that way, I think um, there's a lot more attention on what's happening to the businesses. Um, much of the research on gentrification focused, as I said, on the residents and them being displaced. But now we're seeing a whole kind of swath of businesses that are, or a new generation of businesses entering and... Um, and the question is always, well, what happened to the, the businesses that were there? Mm-hmm. Did they just close? Was it a natural process or were they pushed out or, or what? And so that's what I was doing. Um, I'm sorry, that was kind of a long story, but that's how I came to this research. Uh, yeah. When you were studying this and uh, hearing the stories and 
uh, finding out the the moving pieces behind this um, this problem of of gentrification uh, from the entrepreneur side, from the the black business owner side. Um, you know that f- that flies in the face of what a lot of people say when they go into a neighborhood and they say, uh, "Well, there wasn't anything here before." Yeah, uh, absolutely. That was the kind of the the, the thesis, <laughs> quite <laughs> honestly. Uh, nothing here. There was a c- concentration in terms of. I think I spoke with sixty something business owners. Yeah, and there were and that wasn't everyone. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot there, and that was what I was showing that that. Um, the contradiction in the way the neighborhood is depicted by media, um, by by policymakers, by others in terms of you know our popular understanding of what uh, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, or many of these neighborhoods, Bedford Stuyvesant is or was at a particular moment, and then the, what that neighborhood is to the people that are there, mm-hmm. right? And that is that is a that's a kind of the focal point of much of my research in terms of how we as planners, as, as, as just outsiders understand the other, understand other spaces. And we use this, you know, this kind of homogenizing lens or this lens in which we say, okay, well that neighborhood is good or bad or (laughs) deserving or not deserving or needs this or needs that. But, but without even speaking to people and really understanding whether, and, and you know, the, em, with empathy, you don't even have to speak to people. If people live there, <laughs> mm-hmm. you can imagine that they have a sense of neighborhood or community um, that is probably quite different than your perception of that neighborhood. Sure. It says a lot about the the way that we view from the outside Absolutely. with uh, a default toward the negative instead of mm-hmm. assuming something a little bit more rich and um, complex than we can understand in one fell swoop. Absolutely. Um, what, so based on all of this research and seeing it firsthand yourself uh, in Brooklyn now, how do you, when asked the question that I'm going to ask, <laughs> how do you define gentrification and, and what are the things that people misunderstand about gentrification? So gentrification, in my mind, is not the difficult um, term to define. Perhaps the other one is revitalization. Because gentrification is a very specific set of processes, right? It's a, it's a process by which higher income or higher status people or kind of capital investment enters a neighborhood that had been uh, disinvested, systematically disinvested, and thus kind of lower income, lower status people are the primary kind of residents of that neighborhood. And so by entering the neighborhood, uh, you, the property values, and so you're entering for a very particular reason, you're entering because the property values are low, and but through your process, the process of entering, you, the property values inflate, right? Um, and that leads to displacement of the, the original residents and it also begins to alter the culture and the character of the neighborhood. Um, so that is that definition, although I kind of modified it slightly, it's very much in line with what you know Ruth Glass, who was the British sociologist who coined the term in sixty four, uh, she described it. She described it as a, ra- a rapid process by which all or most original working class occupiers are displaced, and the whole social character of the district has changed. Mm. Um, and we know that it's not just individuals doing it. It's through kind of redevelopment projects and so forth. It's a number of things. But it's a, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, and so we can point to it. We're like, oh, yeah, this neighborhood's gentrifying. And the question for me that really we have to grapple with is we know what it is. We know what happens. So at what point do we intervene and say, okay, we can do something about this? Because the negative part of this is the displacement or the exclusion so that people of lower income can no longer afford to relocate to locate in that neighborhood or they have to be or they're displaced from that neighborhood and or they're displaced so the the issue with gentrification is that we need to do something because it's fundamentally a spatial manifestation of economic inequality Mm -hmm. and so what is the opposite of gentrification then it seems the, the next question yeah, that's a difficult question. I don't know what the opposite is, quite honestly. Um, um, I would say that community revitalization is 
I wouldn't quite say it's an opposite, but it's a different process in that on one hand, revitalization can lead to gentrification if you don't have policies and plans in place to mitigate that. But revitalization, when defined early in the 60s or 70s, it was a bottom-up process. It was a process by which those who are living in the neighborhood have voice um, and action in the in the revitalization pro- in the kind of the renewal process, and the things that are changing in the neighborhood are changing for the residents that currently exist. It's not always a gaze toward who can we attract, but rather how do we improve this space and these conditions for the people that are already here with the presumption that people want to stay in their neighborhood. People experience place attachment, the social cohesion and social networks of places and, and the, you know, and the cultural capital that is in a place um, because of the people that are there is really important and worth preserving. And so if you believe that, then you want to improve the place for the people that are there and not constantly focus on outsiders who can come in it's not that outsiders won't come and shouldn't come it's that the the purpose of revitalization is to improve it for those who are there Mm, and And that's very different and not just displace them and replace it with something that you assume is better than what was there like you were talking about earlier the you know obviously nothing is their uh, idea is completely wrong and uh, Mm -hmm. giving honor to the agency of people who are already um, trying to you know, make a living and improve in ways that you know they can with with the means that they have. It seems like the government uh, and the money that comes from these projects often flows uh, more to, or probably almost exclusively flows to, the people who want to come in with quote unquote better ideas or plans for a community. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, that's often the case. And so, with, if we're really talking about revitalization, we're talking about a very different logic. Right. And and not just focusing on attracting outsiders. So in that sense, it's not really the opposite because it is in some regards. But it's if you do revitalization such that the neighborhood has all the things that are needed and wanted by the people that currently live there. Of course, it's going to be attractive to others. (laughs) Of course, you're going to want to attract businesses because not everyone in the neighborhood is going to be able to open a business. You want new businesses, you know, when you're in in a, you want a coffee shop, you want, uh, you know, other amenities. So almost by definition, that means because of the way that markets work, the values, if you have um, abandoned or or underutilized spaces that become utilized and, and, and beautification is happening, of course, property values are going to go up. But we have mechanisms to keep those in check. That is the difference. With revitalization, you're thinking ahead and putting things in place that allow for all of these improvements, mm-hmm. but they also allow people to stay in place They if they choose. And they and they do that through the policy and planning mechanisms. So you know the 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 the, the land values don't inflate um, exponentially. They don't inflate. I mean that's even more. You know they 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 may go up a bit, but not so much that people can't afford to 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 live there. You used an example in your TED talk about uh, in New York there is waterfront property that was protected. Mm-hmm. Via policy, can you um, explain a little bit more about that process and how it relates to um, keeping land value from increasing in, in gentrification? Yes, I think I can. So I say that because I don't fully remember the example, but I remember ending the TED talk with um, an example of pushing back at this notion that there's nothing we can do, that the market just moves in this kind of natural process. And once investment happens, there's not much we can do. And I I think that's absolutely wrong. And so I use that example because this was Ted, you know, 10X New York. And I was looking for a moment in which, you know, the planning department made a a set of decisions, right? Um, And part of that logic was that Planners often say, well, if we put any mechanisms in place that keep property values reasonable, it will dissuade developers from coming in. Um, 
And I don't agree. I don't think that's the case, right? Developers, private and, and, and not-for-profit developers are in the business of development. And they can still make, you know, a profit or do beautiful projects um, with certain kind of land use and zoning changes that don't allow them to extract all the, <laughs> the values from the from those areas, right? So we have tools like you know different land preservation tools. We have community uh, land trusts that allow for development, but they don't allow for speculative land value. And that's the difference. So that is a huge difference, right? So when we're going and and looking for a property uh, and you're a business owner and you want to make uh, to lease a property, you don't have a lot of latitude if you don't own the business. You're just looking for the best rent, right? Because in most cities, market rents prevail and especially for commercial markets, um, you know, the owner of the business of the building can charge of the property can charge whatever they'd like, right? Well, a community land trust is a tool that allows the community to make, own the land and you can build on the land and there may be property on the land. And most of the time it's for housing, but you can also do it for commercial. And um, you, you have limited liability, I'm sorry, limited equity kind of ownerships so that you can rent, you can own properties, but you can, but you're not doing it with the vision of maximizing you know um profit from those properties right sure. so and that and and you're not doing it with the vision of flipping those properties to make more revenue <laughs> that land is staying in the the community right um the, i mean of course the land stays there but the land, the community trust owns that land and is committed to keeping it affordable for the community so this idea that um, that I was speaking about in in the TED talk is that you know this notion that we can't do anything. Hey, we can't. You know, we need to keep this as a full open market, free market. That means put no uh, you know no regulations on on land or on development. Um, but however, you know, in the early 90s, Department of City Planning knew that our the waterfront, New York City waterfront, was a resource. Um, that they wanted to protect and, and, and for the next generations. So this notion that we should use no rules and regulations because they stymie development, they re- recognize that, that that's silly, that this is a value, a value that we want to protect. Um, and we can put these in place and have development. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always work out that way, meaning the question is always how long does it last, right? Because we're seeing tools being used all over the country and they may have been implemented in the eighties, but they've now they're starting to kind of grandfather out. Well, those are things we can change. We can say, well, is it 20 years or 80 years? You know, that that's kind of up to us. Um, but it's not that it's going to stymie developed. So saying it's up to us is, is, uh, does that mean that we as, uh, citizens and particularly as people who are, you know, if they're business owners that to the city, it seems like a business owner represents something that they want to court a little bit more because it, it looks good for the city. They have lots of small businesses. And, uh, is this something that we actively can be involved in, um, as citizens to create expectations for lawmakers and policymakers? Absolutely. I mean, if we believe in, participatory democracy if we believe that um at least in, in the in the rhetoric of, of of being part of this uh, democratic process if you believe it that means we have to have our elected officials kind of act on our behalf however most of us don't know what we're asking them to do because it's just not part of our day-to-day kind of narratives right but the fact that there are tools that exist out there uh, suggests that we, we do have options to push for things. Mm-hmm. No different than we push for, you know, banning kind of smoking or, uh, you know, or legalizing marijuana, whatever it is. These are, these are, comes from political kind of through collective action, right? And then the, our elected officials are responding to us. And that, that's, I think we forget that we elected them to, to act on our <laughs> behalf, I mean, right? If they're not <laughs> acting on the half behalf of the public, and it's only their, you know, their individual will, then that is a problem. 
So for me, it's like, okay, well, we have these tools and other tools could even be developed. The, the, the challenge is to, to really push our elected officials to, to utilize these tools. And some of them are not palpable at all, right? When we talk about um, commercial rent control, business owners would love that. They would love it. Mm -hmm. And it's been proposed. And I think it's an important tool. Of course, I'm always laughed out of a room, but it's it's an important tool, be, but it's not palpable in this political environment. And it hasn't been for, for decades um, because property owners, you know, the, you know, there's a hierarchy in whose voice gets heard and property owners have a lot of sway in most cities, right? And I think it was a borough president in the 80s, Ruth Messenger, that proposed commercial rent control, and it didn't go anywhere. It totally fell in terms of proposing a bill. That's because the real estate uh, market in New York or the, you know, the real estate owners in New York vehemently opposed to such a thing because that would put some constraints on how much they can increase rents on small businesses upon, you know, once the lease expires. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, you create really vulnerable businesses who can do business year to year when your rent is going up, you know, and you don't fully know how much once your lease is up. So the idea that coffee shops are a harbinger of gentrification is something that's been kind of in the public eye for a long time. There's been uh, you know, protests here and there throughout the last couple of years of you know different coffee shops and and uh, larger uh, cities that are are seen as bringing in gentrification. And in some ways, you know, what you were just talking about, where developers have more sway, they actually bring in coffee shops and they court mm -hmm. business owners to open their second location in an area that's you know up and coming, quote unquote. Um, yes. <laughs> not having arrived, but it's, you know, we're going to help yeah. it arrive. Right. right. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, it leads me to just want to ask, like, what role do you see coffee shops uh, playing in the furthering of gentrification? Because uh, a lot of us, I would assume, see ourselves on the side of revitalization when in actuality, mm -hmm. maybe we're just party to the problem. So you remember in the beginning, I said there's some questions that are really difficult. This was one of the difficult ones <laughs> because I actually do believe it's a lot to put on any type of business. Like, oh, this type of business is the problem. And you're, and I do, I see how coffee shops are being are perceived, and and they can now signify or symbolize uh, gentrification. But there's no one entity that causes gentrification, right? It's a confluence of things. And what you just said in terms of the developers enticing certain business owners to come to up and coming neighborhoods, that's a huge problem right there, mm -hmm. right? It, it can be. And again, I don't want to make these kind of polemical statements, but it, because it means that, you know, a developer is most likely not living in the neighborhood, seeking kind of a business because they may have a contract that, oh, we have to have some local, locally owned or small businesses alongside some of these anchor institutions, anchor businesses. Um, and so they go outside to find a business. Well, the business owner is listening to the developer and not thinking, not really cognizant of what's happening on the ground in the neighborhood. And so when they enter, they are often uninformed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the problem. And whether, and I know you're focusing specifically on coffee shops, but it's this, it's a conundrum because it's not all coffee shops, right? Um, as you know, and I don't, I wouldn't want to say that the coffee shop is the problem, is you know the the harbinger of gentrification, and that all coffee shops are this way. There are some, and I know you were talking about kind of more of the boutique coffee shops, not the chains, but even among those, they there's a huge there's a there's a huge spectrum of how owners enter spaces, whatever you're owning. I think when, when owners can enter a space and recognize that, you know, how is this space going to be used? Who are we trying to attract to this space? Did the community really ask for a coffee shop? Or is it just that this is where I see value, they see value, or where, you know, your friends hang out or starting to hang out, their bars around here. And, you know, you, you see this as the quote unquote up and coming area. Well, for whom? Or is it for the, the residents that are there? Are your price points you know, comparable to the median income? Does it, you know, and so not doing that difficult work usually creates problems. 
But mm-hmm. I've also seen many examples of coffee shops that that work really well in in communities. You know, what well, what are the coffee shops that work well in communities, or maybe just small businesses that are technically from the outside um, of the neighborhood? If they come into a neighborhood and add value, in what ways are they adding value without displacing and um, disinvesting the the local uh, people and business owners? And so it's always a, it's still a question of like who's inside, who's outside, right? So did the re- did a resident of the neighborhood create the coffee shop? Maybe not, but someone that is connected or feels or understands the the neighborhood in a particular way. So I'm I'm new to Chicago and I live on the South Side, um, and I learned of a coffee shop in Inglewood. Inglewood is one of those neighborhoods on the South Side of Chicago that. Um, uh, I don't know exactly the median income, but it's probably, you know, the high 20s, low 30s when the median income for the city is about in the 50s. Um, it's predominantly black. And when I say predominantly, I would say probably 90 percent at least. And it has a, 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 um, a stigma attached to it in terms of, you know, crime and and, you know, poor schools and so forth. That is the outside perception of Inglewood if you've never been there. Right. Mm hmm. Um, and I and I don't live in this neighborhood, but I um, have, you know, I've, I've gone to the neighborhood and I see, I understand the difference between the, the outside perception of the neighborhood and then how people understand their neighborhood and what they're trying to do. There's a coffee shop there. Uh, I think it's called Kusanya or something like that. That is lovely. It's a lovely coffee shop that. Um, I can't speak too much about it, but I, in the sense that I don't know a lot about it, but it's used by residents, right? People see it as a space. It's a community space. And that's what coffee shops do. They create spaces for people to gather, mm-hmm. right? Very much like bars and so forth. Um, and so if you don't feel welcome in that space, for whatever the reason, there could be a confluence of reasons that you may not feel welcome or that you can't, you, you feel like it's a, it's this beautiful space, but I can't afford to do anything there. And I probably can't just sit there if I can't buy anything. Then, then there's, there's a challenge there. Now, Cause then you already, you don't see this as a space for you, for your community where this coffee shop that I'm speaking about, it's hires residents locally, pays decent wages, and it's used by the community, right? It's a gathering space. It's marketed as a gathering space, coffee shop and creative gathering space. Mm -hmm. That's a very different, that's a very different way of of entering um, a lower income neighborhood, right? And so I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I think there are examples of of that, right? We, We, it's the challenges when you fail to do the due diligence and you, you, you enter a space because of affordability and you think, okay, this will be the, the spot. Well, how are you engaging with people? Mm. You know, how mm. are you, you can't, and you can't just hire, not just hire, you can't just have one, a partner that kind of looks like the residents <laughs> um, and think that that'll do. That's not, people are, are savvier than that. They know the difference. Sure. <laughs> right. So I think we try to work around these things and we think, oh, we're, and I believe people really want to do good. Like, oh, this will be great. But, you know, the cultural competence of, of business owners is, is important. You know, I, I heard that time and time again from the business owners I interviewed. We're in all coffee shops, some were. But that notion of, oh, people walked past the shop not thinking that it was for them. Well, these are public-private spaces, right? Any business we should be allowed of any people of any color or st- economic, socioeconomic status should be able to walk in any sh- shop. But we know. It depends on the music that's being played or who else is in there, what it looks like. There are different cues that make spaces feel more or less welcoming. Mm. And no one business can accommodate everyone. And it shouldn't or it's, it probably wouldn't work, right? You're, try, you're probably trying to have more of a niche in some way. In, in, in some way. But when you're entering a neighborhood that's quote unquote up and coming, you, the way in which you do that and what you have to be cognizant of it's probably very different than when you're entering a neighborhood that, you know, is well developed. Even there, you need to know. I mean, people, if, if as a business owner, so this is where my MBA side comes in. You have to do the, the feasibility study, right? You have to have a sense of who your market is. You have to, you, you have to have a, you know, do the numbers so that you feel that you can generate the revenue month to month 
to, to meet your fixed costs and the, the variable costs, right? Your operating costs for you. you. These are things you have to do at a basic, at a minimum. Mm-hmm. And so you have to have some sense of who's there, right? And, and um, so it's hard to imagine that business owners open with no knowledge. So then the question is, well, why weren't you more attentive to the reality of who's here and not just gaze, keep your, your gaze on um, who you hope will come and, you know, your, your homies coming to the shop and, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a conundrum. I realize. <laughs> and it sounds like you're assuming that people will just love you because yeah. you're, you're, there's no coffee shop in this neighborhood and I, we're bringing something that people aren't used to. We're going to really focus on the menu and we're going to focus on bringing great coffee to this area is what a lot of people think. Um, and something that we've talked about on, on this show in prior episodes is the idea that your, your shop be a reflection of the community and that you're, you're also a people first person, you know, you, you, your business exists as like you were saying a gathering space. It's a community space. Coffee shops have really always been that way. Mm-hmm. So it seems like if you're just eliminating that part in, in what your main focus is on, you're inevitably going to end up in this position of, of alienating people, even if it wasn't your intention. Yes, absolutely. When should a coffee shop not open in <laughs> a space? So uh, there's this assumption that we should always like come in and, and try and add value. And, and it's, I, I want to think back to what you were talking about before where you've got um, uh, black owned businesses that are there. They have agency. There's uh, the local businesses and community. When do you, you look at the place and be like, well, we're not going to really add more than what's already here. Let's not open there. Well, I guess that's it. I mean, or how, I don't know. You know, it's only in reality is that business owners have the right to open wherever they can afford to open, right? That's how the market um, operates. However, that's not the conversation here that we just move through market principles, right? So there are other principles that we have to think about. And, for me, that means we not just ask the question, can we operate here in terms of feasibility, but really think about, well, how can we, how should we enter? And then that's the, then from there we get to, should we even do it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Because it might not have a coffee shop. It just so happened in the neighborhood that I studied. There were, there were a couple of wonderful coffee shops, but there were things that didn't exist. Um, that perhaps could have come, but it's really the question of how. How do we get to know this neighborhood? What's our vision for for entering? Um, and even and then once you enter, how do you participate in the community? So that became a huge thing. There was op- there there was conflict in terms of what the community needs and. You know, how the business owners engage, new business owners engage with community residents um, and so forth. So I would push back and ask business owners to think about, well, why did you choose this space? Why here? Right. Are you a resident of this neighborhood? Why do you think this neighborhood is the ideal uh, space just because there's no current coffee shop? You know, I, I think if we're really honest with ourselves about what what's motivating your business location strategy. Many business owners will come to this conclusion that, okay, well, it's not really about creating a community space. And that's okay, right? Because you're not, you're not starting a not-for-profit to create a community space. You are trying to start a business. But you know, I think that there's something disingenuous when you are saying you are, and we're trying to create this, oh, this would be great for the community. Every community needs it. But you're not really trying to create a welcoming space. If you want to have an exclusive boutique, do that. But then be very clear about doing that, that that's what you're trying to do. That's your intention. Um, and you will be treated, you know, <laughs> it, it depends. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes I think the honesty is actually what or the dishonesty is what causes the problem. So if you have an exclusive boutique that only, you know, you have somebody at the door and they can only certain folks can o- enter. Well, at least people know what that is, and that's your intention, and that's how it's performed. I think I think it's there's ambiguity with coffee shops. Yeah, and it seems and like you're going to have to overcome that 
unfortunate stigma that coffee shops do have where, Mm -hmm. you you know, maybe another business might not have to fight as hard to win over the trust of people, but because of media and the way the chips fall, um, it it seems like you might have to work extra hard to win people over. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Going from this conversation as, as business owners or maybe hopeful business owners and uh, people who are just coffee professionals and we, we're troubled by gentrification and I hope that everybody listening to this is, um, what can we do practically speaking, you know, even this week to start making a difference, um, to, you know, with preventative strategies or how can we move forward to be a part of the solution to the problem instead of uh, being party to it? Um, so this week, so if you're already in business, I think, you know, the, 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 um, the way in which your business operates, I think there are things that you can do. You probably can't mitigate gentrification because that's beyond, you know, your individual action. It's just, if your if your store entered, uh, occupies a store, a space that was, you know, that was abandoned or was uh, vacant, you know, your entry is already improving, increasing the property values, right? But you, once you're there, I think it's important to think about, well, what kind of community services am I doing? And I don't mean, okay, am I going to have, you know, a, a, you know, a, a food, a food collection <laughs> right. or something in the, in the store that may not be it. But, you know, we see examples all over the country of, of, um, of coffee shops and other businesses doing things for residents and with residents that are are kind of interesting and unique. So, you know, if it's having some type of collection at your, at the register where you allow residents to, you know, pay forward for somebody that maybe couldn't afford the price of, of, um, you know, high end latte, such and such, sorry, I don't have all the lingo. Um, uh, you know, so that to me is an interesting model because then you allow people to come in that maybe couldn't afford it. And you not just allow them, you encourage them to come in. And it's a win-win situation in that way because the neighbor, that suggests there's already gentrification because there's some folks that can pay for it. And, um, but you also have days that, you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays are kind of pay it forward days. Um, or you do community events that really are about and reflect the community. Right. So you do whatever. I mean, I remember the, the one that I really liked in Fort Greene. They did. You know, I think they had uh, some kind of music events in the evening and um, I forgot some other cultural events. They had some kind of like poetry reading something. This was, you know, in the early 90s, late 90s. Or, I mean, early 2000s. Or, um, whatever it was, it was reflecting the desires of the community. And so the space when after the the coffee shop closed, the space was used for other things um, or, you know, later in the evening. So it, it, it's I think there's a variety of things that the owners can do. But once you enter and you don't have trust, then it becomes more challenging because how do you reach out now and say and to whom are you reaching out to, to create these opportunities right, for residents to come and enjoy the space? And don't and not feel the pressure of oh I have to consume more, but rather just come and enjoy the space. And I think over time by doing that and people seeing that, that your relationship to the community will be dramatically different. Great. Um, th- this has been a really fascinating and rich time for me to learn about this and for us to learn about this. Um, and I'm really honored to have gotten the chance to talk to you about it because it's such a huge issue, um, you know, for us as, you know, our industry, you know, the harbingers <laughs> of, of gentrification. Um, we we need to be more active and we need to be more cognizant of, of how we impact the social uh, realities around us and economic realities. And I think all that you've shared has really helped equip us with a better understanding to move forward in a positive way. Um, How can we learn further? Um, How can we uh, get in contact with with you and your work? Um, What can we do in in those terms? 
what I, I tell my students, there's so many models, really interesting models that get written up in different places. If you're if you're really an urbanite and really um, interested in some of these things, I mean, one of my favorite kind of online journals is uh, uh, Next City, and I think there's another one. I forget the top. If probably I forget, but but they're really you know I learn about a lot of the interesting examples of. Um, the relationship between these business owners and communities through um, these online sources. Um, in terms of my work, uh, you know, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Chicago in Department of Urban Planning and Policy. Uh, so, you know, I'm available um, in terms of reaching out. My contact information is online. Um, my email is my last name S U T T O N S and then S at uic.edu. Um, so yeah, feel free to reach out and, and you know, and uh, let me know what you think. In terms of my ongoing research, and I'm still doing work on gentrification. I just published a, um, a paper on gentrification and um, and racial transition. Um, I'm, but I'm also doing work on kind of collective ownership models. So it's not just on gentrification, but things that I think can help. More businesses open um, and more people enter business through kind of cooperative structures and you can end this idea of economic democracy. So and, and I think even, the, you know, the coffee industry, that there's a lot of cooperatives in the coffee industry outside, especially outside of the United States, but but also here. And I, I, I think there are different ways of thinking about you know, ownership and and providing a really high end product. Excellent. Um, we'll definitely link to those things in the show notes of, of this show. And um, I, I thank you so much. This has been really great. And I thank you for your work as well. Uh, it's just brilliant stuff that helps us be better uh, citizens and, you know, develop our communities in a, in a much more uh, rich and uh, valuable way. So um, thank you for your time today. This was this was oh, great. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is great. Well, I hope this conversation with Dr. Sutton was helpful to you and is going to be something that will help you help others as well. As I mentioned in the beginning of this program, um, we have a lot of responsibility when we seek to open a shop in a neighborhood. There is a wake that we leave behind us, and we are responsible for the impact that we have on our communities. And I think it would break our hearts if we truly knew some of the negative consequences that result from um, absent-minded placement of coffee shops, to put it in a you know mild way. So if we listen to what we heard today and just let it inform the way we approach communities and at least put equal measure of thought into getting to know and respect and honor the communities that we seek to be a part of, the way we do with coffee, you know, the way we do with um, our baristas, hopefully, this is part of the process of being a third place, to be a place that offers to enhance the cohesion of a neighborhood, um, not as uh, Dr. Sutton says in, in one of her in some of her research, to upend that community. We want to be part of the solution. We want people to have a cup of coffee that doesn't symbolize a tearing apart, but a coming together. In, in this process of understanding gentrification, I think, once we do understand it, will help give us the knowledge to fight it. Um, you know, I, I want to encourage you, too. This, this episode has a lot of links in the show notes. Um, there are different publications that Dr. Sutton has provided me links to that are prefaces to these, uh, these published journals. Unfortunately, the distribution of these journals is pretty um, limited uh, because of copyright and things like that. Um, I've provided some links not only to the TED Talk that she gave, but also to um, another lecture she gave at the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, and a link also to a conversation that uh, Jasper Wilde and Ashley Rodriguez over at Boss Barista had uh, way back in their episode 25 called There Was Nothing Here Before This, <laughs> which is something you hear a lot from people when they seek to open in lower-income neighborhoods. Ashley and Jasper talk with great clarity on this subject of gentrification. I think it's a great supplement to what you just heard in this episode, so I've provided a link for that as well. And the last thing I'll say about research is that you probably have access to um, urban planning 
centers or schools locally. Uh, even if you're in a small town, there might be one uh, bigger city nearby that has a school of urban planning and public affairs. And I actually didn't even know this, but I, you know, in order to go to one of my shifts downtown at the University of Louisville, there uh, I park right next to one. And so I've actually been able to serve an Americano to the assistant professor of urban planning there. And I'm definitely going to be uh, looking into, you know, learning more about this subject because that resource is available. And I'm going to bet that it's available to you too. In terms of uh, action that we can take, one of the things that I think would be really fantastic is, you know, something that uh, back in a Founder Friday episode with Nathan Quillo of Quill's Coffee, he mentioned that one of the things that was valuable as a business owner was getting to know the city and how it works and who's who and getting to know the inner workings and the gears that make up this complex machinery of the city. Take, take that mentality to say you want to figure out what the land use policies of your community are. You want to let your voice be heard when it comes to being an advocate for those who don't have enough voices advocating on their behalf. If we let our voices be known as professionals, and especially as uh, those of you who are business owners, let your voice be known to the city and the community where your values lie, then it's more likely that policy can change. You can vote on policy, you can let your voice be heard, and be an advocate for people um, and uh, for communities that ultimately get steamrolled by this process. We can show our support for the community and give our voice for the community by supporting um, already existing businesses in the areas that we are thinking about opening a shop and also uh, invest into others who can run shops in those areas who are local, who are planted, live there, have history there, have have um, rapport there. You, sometimes it's not the best thing. No matter how good the idea is or how well thought out to open a business in a neighborhood uh, where there exists already a pool of talent and ambition just waiting to be tapped into. So um, yeah, there's a lot of challenging things in this episode, uh, but we need that in coffee, we do. And I'm personally challenged to reach out and learn more myself because we have to be not just advocates of the coffee community, but of the communities that we serve coffee to. So my thanks to Dr. Sutton for joining us on the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was such a great honor to have you on the show. Uh, thank you for your work, and I look forward to seeing uh, more of it in the future. Thank you for inspiring us and educating us. Now, if you want the show notes for this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com. You'll find there a uh, tab on the side where you can enter your email address. When you do that, you'll be signed up to receive the show notes to your inbox directly. And the show notes are basically the links and the main takeaways from the conversation. So the questions, the answers, the main points made by um, myself or the guest. And that's really helpful as a reference to help you digest the information in each episode. Um, included also in the show notes are uh, little tidbits about news for Keys to the Shop and Keys to the Shop Consulting. And uh, yeah, go to the Keys to the Shop website, put your email address in, and you won't be sorry that you did. Now, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can do so by emailing chris at keys to the shop.com. And uh, there you can just ask me questions, um, give me feedback, your thoughts. Um, I want to make this show better for you all the time. So if there are things that I can do better on Keys to the Shop, definitely let me know. Now, if you want to hire Keys to the Shop for consultation and training, you can also email me there and we'll have a conversation about what you need in your business and your career. And I'll be happy to help. That's chris at keys to the shop.com. So thanks for joining me today. I hope we go out there today with new inspiration to be um, really advocates for our community, to be solutions to gentrification, to further our understanding on it, and to really um, establish ourselves as a third place that honors place. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate all of you taking the time to listen. And as always, I truly hope that this episode has given you keys to the shop.